reactive training systems. Only 16 more years till I'm a master. <laughs> I mean, that's everybody's countdown these days. It's like, right. how long until I can be a master? Yeah. But then, then you got some of these guys like Mark that screw it up for everybody. I'm telling you. I'm doing my best, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but by the time we're masters, won't Mark be an M8? <laughs> yeah, but well, I'm, like, yeah, Mark will be Mark, dead. <laughs> Mark is setting uh, M1 records as an M2 or almost an M3, right, Mark? Right. Yep. Yeah. I heard heard that was a bit of consternation this year. But talking to Polly too what? much, I think. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. About the M three thing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I mean, what blows me away is David Ricks. You know, I mean, he's occasionally hitting open world records oh, and no. stuff, and. And the number lifetime of PR. Yeah, lifetime yeah. PRs and, and the number of American records he must have is must be looked like a book, you know. Oh uh, Yeah, man. It, I'm starting to think that we ought to have Dave Ricks be like a regular panelist on our podcast because he comes up about every episode, you know. Like just what a amazing example. Like that I don't know, that guy's just such a cool cool lifter and just a, a neat guy to talk to, you know. Absolutely. Uh, what I was hoping we could get into a little bit today, uh, it's been a little while since we've done one of these panel discussions. I'd like to talk a little bit about technique. Um, so not intentionally, I kind of made a, a, a Facebook post earlier uh, this week about the 80% technique heuristic that we use. Um, and just kind of real quick, I'll, I'll talk about what that is, but um, I was surprised that it, like, I don't know, I didn't expect it to get much of a reaction, but it seems like it's gotten a, a huge reaction, but um, it's, it's a thing that I don't hear people talk about that much, but I don't know. Anyway, I, th I was thinking maybe we could talk about it and see if we can figure this thing out. So kind of kind of where I start with technique and this this eighty percent technique heuristic that I talk about. Um, if you have one or two small technical deviations, then that's that's above the standard, that's above the line, and that you should focus on just getting stronger. Uh, that you don't need to have absolutely pristine, perfect technique in order to get strong in a safe way. Uh, so one or two small deviations are allowed, but if you've got a major deviation or just kind of a whole list of minor deviations, uh, then, then you're below the standard and you need to get that stuff fixed before you move forward, uh, before you focus on strength. Like at that point, your focus is on improving your technique. So just to kind of clarify my definitions a little bit, a major error is going to be anything that gets you disqualified in competition and anything that um, uh, anything that's going to cause like in a near term injury. So think of like rounding your back on the squat or, um, you know, flaring your elbows too much on the bench, you know, some things like that. Uh, I think the getting disqualified in competition is, is fairly obvious. Um, <clears throat> but those would be major errors. Uh, minor errors will be other technical errors. So other, other things that are not perfect, uh, but it's not going to result in red lights. It's not going to result in an immediate injury. I mean, things add up over time, right? And so anyway, that's kind of the, the gist of it. And there's a little bit more detail, but uh, I kind of want to stop talking right now and, and hear what you guys have to say about it. Uh, what sorts of techniques or heuristics do you guys use uh, with the people that you coach? Um, just kind of thoughts on technical, te technical mastery, I guess. I guess I can start. Um, so that's something that I think when we, 
like when I first started working with RTS, like it was a huge kind of game changer in how I was actually coaching because I definitely knew a lot about technique and what looked really good, but it might have also been holding back a lot of my clients and, and preventing them from getting stronger because I was, you know, not focusing on the good parts of the lifting uh, and, and kind of focusing on the negative. And so at least when coaching, the biggest thing that I've changed in my, you know, philosophy is more so the language used when trying to correct technique um, and, and when people are giving me feedback, it's more about, you know, focus on the 80% that's good. Make sure that's kind of at the forefront, but then re recognizing sure there might be 20% of the list that could be improved, but, but making sure that they understand that, like, that's just to work on in the future. I mean, I'm always about trying to make sure everything's as good as possible. There's certain leverage uh, and mechanical advantages to, you know, maybe making sure your elbow is like directly underneath the bar on the bench press or something like that. That I want them to work on, but it's going to take time anyway. And, and like, it's not like I can just tell them to change something and, and immediately the next workout, they're going to be fit. Uh, and that's, that's huge is, is understanding that there's a lot of exercises that might be implemented to allow that natural change in technique that, you know, I would, I would have usually just said 15 cues and confused the hell out of them. You know, like that's essentially what's going to be required for those smaller technical changes. And, and I think that's like the biggest change is this more so focusing on, okay, cool. 80% is good. Great work. Here's some exercises I want you to work on and maybe one or two cues um, to kind of continuously work on that. You're going to probably, I'm going to say them to you almost every week. Uh, so that's probably my, my take on that. I think oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I was just going to say I, I agree with what uh, Jim's say, saying and that's kind of how I try to coach too is if I see something I just try to say here's what you need to do you know focus on this and here's how to do it and this is why or this is what may problems might occur if you if you don't focus on this or don't you know, correct this, whatever, but not, don't focus on the, on the problem, obviously. And of course, a lot of these problems, <clears throat> they're very common. You know, it's a lot of the same things with a lot of folks. Um, so anyway, go ahead, Mike. Um, something that just came to mind while, while you guys were talking, um, this notion of, of, if there's something that, that kind of falls short of perfect technique, uh, but it's not, you know, one of these major errors that I'm talking about, um, you know, you've, you've got some minor problems. Let's say that um, you're pressing the bar uh, toward your feet a little bit too much in the bench, or uh, you've got a little bit of, of knee valgus in, in your squat, you know, nothing, nothing huge, nothing that's like, Hey, that's a problem, but it's like, it's not, it's not perfect. Um, so you're over that 80% line and it's like you guys are saying, uh, you can mention it, you can cue it. Um, it's something for the lifter to think about and, and strive for, uh, but it's not necessarily something that they need to take the focus away from, from getting strong. You know, uh, the focus is still getting stronger. The focus is still putting more weight on the bar. Um, of course try for that technical perfection but that doesn't have to happen right now because it's not going to happen right now anyway um it's something that's going to take a long time and over time you develop that technical perfection and you know kind of to what you guys are saying as well you're going to run into certain situations certain uh, technical deviations and you know, they're minor, they're minor in the sense that they're not going to cause any, any injuries or red lights. Um, but they're things that you want to fix. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is this, uh, chest fall pattern in the squat. Uh, we see that extremely commonly, you know, uh, almost everybody does it when the weight gets heavy enough. So, uh, one thing to think about there is that we see that that's a lot of times a result of, uh, um, you know, a weakness in this case, 
uh, weak quads a lot of times if we're going to narrow it down to a specific muscle group. But you can look at it from a mechanic uh, standpoint as well. Um, and you can address that and improve it without ever necessarily having to cue it and without ever necessarily having to limit the load that the lifter is, is using. You know, they can think, even if you do cue it and they're thinking about it and, and practicing uh, doing it better with the competition lift, you know, well, they can still judge their RPE off of actual failure and not technical failure and, and uh, you know, keep pressing forward in terms of building strength. And then that technical mastery will get there eventually. And that, that's a, uh, another huge point. That's what I was going to mention too, Mike, is that there's, with this technique stuff, I think you really got to tease out what actually is technique and what is weakness. Because there's a fine line there, you know, and, and with improved strength, as you said, which doesn't occur overnight, the technique might clean itself up, basically. Uh, and so as a coach, I think that's a really important thing. One big thing that I've noticed or learned myself is uh, basically the need to differentiate between a, a strength deficit and a technique problem. Because you can't, you can't fix a strength deficit with technique. You know, <clears throat> I mean, you that's, can, a, that's an interesting point. Go ahead. Well, so, you know, as you, like you were saying before about chest, Paul, and well, like we talked about a long time ago with uh, tightness in the bottom of a deadlift, if a, if a lifter doesn't have the strength to create the tension necessary in the bottom of a deadlift, it's going to make their technique look a little off, you know, not getting as tight as they can, as they need to. But they're not able to get as tight as they need they need to because they don't have the strength yet. So it's an ongoing coaching, strength progression type thing, you know. Yeah. Well, then too, if you add in fatigue in there, if you have somebody who is a technical, technically sound lifter, and those technical their technical ability breaks down as they fatigue across across the workload. Yep. Um, it's not necessarily a technique error. It's just a matter of they don't have the strength to continue to lift in a sound manner. And that's that's a good point, Ross, because that's one thing that I try to use as a gauge. You know, I try to to basically drive a lifter or I want to see video of them at when they're fatigued, when they're at the end of a hard down set and things are starting to break down. Then you can kind of see it's easier to see what's a strength issue and what's the technique issue? You know, if their yeah. technique is good until they get fatigued and then it starts falling apart, you can see how it's falling apart and that helps to identify what the strength uh, issue is. I'm with you there. Like uh, that's, that's probably the most valuable uh, in terms of like analyzing video and, and figuring out what we need to do from a training standpoint. That's probably the most valuable video that you get is video of, of hard set, you know? Like, I review a lot of video, especially with guided programming, and I get a lot of people that send in video of RPE seven set, you know, and you know, it's like a set of six at RPE seven. Man, there's just nothing to see there because if there was a technical breakdown, chances are that breakdown's gonna look a lot different when you're doing, a, you know, a 95% single, you know? And most of the time, there's just not that much breaking down because most people that we coach have been doing this long enough that they, they get the basics, they get the fundamentals of it, and they're going to be doing it mostly right when the weights are light. You know, the problem is that you've got to do it right when the weights are heavy. And that's a different skill. And that's another reason I think that if you've got a lifter who has fallen below this, uh, this 80% proficiency line and they need to focus on good technique at that point yeah you probably need to to reduce the weight somewhat so that they can do it correctly but we're still not talking about like super easy weights i think you know putting a, an empty bar on your back and practicing 
I mean, that's useful if you're just learning the movements, you know, but if you've been lifting weights for a couple of years, then that's run its course. You know, you're not going to derive much more from that. You've got what you can get from it. You have to, it's the same as, as trying to see growth in any other area of your training. You have to challenge yourself. And if you're trying to improve your technical proficiency, you've got to put a load on the bar that is difficult to execute correctly, but you ultimately win. You know, if you, that's, that's training. That's what training is. You know, it's, it's a challenge that you have to overcome, but you eventually overcome it. And then you can then practice and work on overcoming bigger challenges later on. Like that's essentially the whole process, you know? So I think you've got to put a weight on the bar. That's a challenge for the lifter. Um, that's why I don't agree too much with the, you know, the super light technical work, um, you know, and, and the insane attention to detail. I mean, but attention to detail is by and large seen as a positive thing. And, and I guess it is right. But if you take your attention to detail and focus it on the minutia and you miss these other uh, big trees in the forest, then you're not focusing on the right things, you know? You can do 50% technique work and focus on, oh, well, your big toe wasn't gripping the floor quite how I wanted it to. It's like, okay, but remember that this is powerlifting and sooner or later you need to put a heavy weight on the bar, right? So it, it's, it's, and that's what the whole 80% technique perfection mentality is about. It's like, we've got to find a balance point, you know, that, yeah, improving your technique is important, but you can over focus on, on minutia, you know, and, and it seems like this is one of those pendulums that swings back and forth and for a while, no one cares and everybody's in. I think it's actually a lot more significant with like, you know, with Instagram, uh, when people post their videos to Instagram, they're, they have a coach and then they have 800 Instagram coaches. And, you know, a lot of it, I don't even know, maybe their coach is also saying these things too, but, you know, a lot of times you'll see someone that has knee, knee, knee caving or uh, you know, knee, knee valve gets in the squat. And the, well, I don't even know. Sometimes the Instagram coaches are better. <laughs> but for the most part, you know, people will say, oh, that's a weakness. Like that's a glute weakness, definitely glute weakness. Like no matter what, all the time, every time. Because for me, for me, when I fix my knee valgus, I strengthen my glutes, and therefore you should do that too. But like, understanding the difference between the, the weakness and the um, strength, and then a technical inefficiency, really comes from I think experience and and not being so quick to make that decision. You know, like, okay, back up for a second. How long have you been lifting? You know, like what, like, even have you even looked at like where the foot position is? Because a lot of times you can just look where the feet are and then look what the knees are doing. Are the knees not able to keep in line with the toes? Uh, and that's something that could simply be fixed by maybe narrowing uh, the, the, the foot position. And it could look like a weakness, but like your glutes aren't just going to get stronger than, you know, ever from adding some hip circles to your warm up. Like, I don't. That's something that for me, I'm like, well, how could that fix the entire problem? You got to get glute you know? activation. <laughs> <laughs> you, your glutes have to be firing. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Otherwise, so, you might fall on the floor. Yeah. You know, we've had this conversation before. <laughs> I think probably, yeah. You know, but, <laughs> anyway, no, like, you're, that's, you're, that's a huge right. thing. You're exactly right, Jim. And there was a... You remember that it's been a while ago now, but there was a picture that started making the rounds of uh, uh, it was like a skeleton, basically uh, looking at hip architecture differences between different skeletons, you know, and visually they're just very different, you know, and if you look at them and you think like, well, yeah, if you, you took these two people and tried to have them squat the same way, like that's just not going to work. And oh, by the way, it turns out that you can't see their hip architecture from the outside. And I mean, 
it seems like every conversation comes back to individualization. And, and I like that. I like that that's a theme for us is that we are pretty radical about individualizing this approach. Because I think that's the only way that you get the absolute most that you can get out of each individual athlete. You know, um, the technique that they that they use, the solutions to different problems that they have, like that has to that has to be applied to each individual. We were just talking uh, before we started this about bench training. Now we're way off from technique, guys, but <laughs> we were talking about bench training. And Mark, I was looking at at the program that that you sent and I, I want to digest this more. Um, but this is a program that you're saying is, is successful for the bench presses for stubborn bench presses that you're dealing with as a coach. And when I look at it, it's very different from what I've seen to be effective for me personally. Now there's no right or wrong there. It's just individual differences. We see that all the time. Like, I don't respond that well to, to long pause benching, but other people surely do. Um, Kelly Branton is one of them and he's a world record holder in the bench. So, I mean, there's tons of different responses that are possible, you know, and it's about trying to tease out what your individual best response is going to be, you know, and, and you got to be paying attention. If you're not paying attention and switched on, then you, you miss those signals for sure. Yeah, another thing that's pretty cool is when you actually like listen to what is a big game changer here, you guys. Um, but like <laughs> actually listening to what the the clients are saying about you know their concerns with with their movements and the exercises that you're programming for them. And you know, like when I first started out coaching, I don't know what five years ago, like I would have this idea that this exercise is gonna fix what's wrong. And they're going to do it and it's going to fix everything. Like I was just so certain of my decision that like it didn't matter what they had to say. They were, they, <laughs> you know, the client was wrong. Like I, I know what I'm doing. You're hiring me. Um, and I know it's very arrogant, but like a lot of people who start with coaching, it's like, oh, I know what I'm doing for me. This works for me. Therefore, it's more for everybody, you know. And over time, I've realized like a lot of it has to do with this, this person it works for them for whatever reason and and then making a modification like if somebody says two in staff the deadlifts really don't feel well with me and they don't like how that makes my comp competition deadlift feel i'm not going to force that on them because then that's going to play into enjoying training and then we come back to what really matters is a technique or getting stronger you know and, yeah. and then that's really what like, what do they want to do essentially? Because that's going to get them stronger than me saying that the deadlifts are going to fix their, I don't know, weak hamstrings or something, whatever the reason. Yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for tying that back to technique for me. I wasn't sure how we were going to get back there. <laughs> <laughs> technique so, of coaching. So, question, <laughs> exactly. A question for you guys to, to mull around a bit. Um, we talked a little bit. Yeah, we talked a little bit about like if you're a lifter who falls below this threshold and you need to focus on technique about how you might do that. Uh, although if you guys want to add any more to that topic, you know, I'm certainly open to hearing that. Um, another topic to, to think about is if you're a lifter who's above this line um, and maybe you've got a habit of, of overanalyzing your technique or something like that, how do you not focus on technique so much? How would you go about doing that? I know that's kind of a weird question. How do you not focus on something? But um, just to add a little bit more to uh, how do you fix technique? A lot of the ways that I like to, to do that is by slowing the lift down. Um, uh, pauses, long pause work in squat bench or deadlift uh, lets you feel what that correct position is like and and move out of that position uh and slower tempo work also helps you feel the mechanic of it so uh the main thing is going to be just practice doing the movement correctly and you need appropriate loading and and volumes and things like that uh in your competition exercise but there are some supplemental and systems exercises that you can use to kind of help you along along your uh along the way there now that I bought you guys a, a little time, <laughs> anybody yeah. think of, think of, I'm, uh, yeah, 
Well, I was going to say, uh, I think, uh, you know, from, from my standpoint as a coach, if I can call people out on RPEs, basically, that's, that's it. If somebody is executing something at what they're calling a nine and it's immaculate technique wise, then, you know, and, and I look at it and it's, I don't think it is a nine. I think it's an eight shoot might even be a seven or something like, no, that wasn't a nine put more weight on there because until I see something starting to break down, like we were talking about, I mean, I don't care how good a lifter you are, or how strong you are, you put enough weight on the bar and you do it, you know, do it enough times, something is going to start showing up. You know, some weakness is going to start showing up somewhere or technique breakdown or something. If you see no technique breakdown anywhere in any of the drops, anything else, uh, then that's kind of a red flag to me that uh, uh, they're not using enough weight. I've seen maybe one or two lifters ever that seem to be able to go all the way up to failure and and not, not have anything, at least obviously, wrong with their technique um so yeah i mean in large part i think i think i'm with you on that um but you're you still still with that you're seeing if they go to failure they're failing on because of strength yeah yeah so so it's kind of a what you're saying is it's kind of a combination between like look i don't see any technical breakdown at all and your bar speed is fast you know, like, look, that wasn't really uh, a nine RPE. You need to push the weight up uh, more. And, you know, I got this question uh, earlier this week as well. Like, hey, is this ever a problem that you really actually see in real life? And like, oh, well, yeah, actually we do <laughs> quite a bit. I would say that that I see, especially lately, like in, in the last couple years, I see more people with the problem of being technical perfectionists I see that more often than I see people with technique that's just uh, not passable, (laughs) you know? Like, it's funny, when I first got into this sport, it was kind of a joke where powerlifters would make fun of people who squatted high and stuff like that. And and I'm sure that you can still find people that do that. You just go to a commercial gym. But by and large, you know, people that are squatting, they get it, you know? And, and, you know, to take us off topic again, I think we got CrossFit to thank, thank for a lot of that because they teach the lifts in a proficient way, you know, for the most part. Um, there's things that you can pick on, but usually squat depth isn't, isn't one of them. Um, so I don't see people doing things that you're like, oh, my God, we have to start over. You know, like I don't get that very often. I, I see a lot more people who are, uh, you know, well – you know, my, my right ankle twists a half a degree whenever I squat over, you know, my third warm up weight, you know, like, do you think that's a problem? Well, does it hurt? No, then no, it's not a problem. You know, um, not, uh, nobody has like limbs that are perfectly proportioned and, and, you know, bodies that are perfectly symmetrical. It's just not a thing. Yeah, and I guess what what my point was, and what you've sort of uh, uh, you know evolved that is basically if you push things far enough, you're either going to get technique breakdown or you're going to get strength failure. And uh, if you're not getting either one of those ever, then you're probably erring on the side of being too critical about your technique. I think yeah. that oh Ross go ahead um, yeah I was just saying yeah I, I <laughs> <laughs> well I was going to say that I think that as people with more and more and this is obviously something more personal for me but like the more you're in the gym the, the more likely you are to eventually get hurt and once that initial injury happens depending on how severe it is whether it's putting you out of the game for a year or two. Um, I think a lot of people have to, they go right to, Oh, it was a technique thing. And, you know, sometimes that might be true. Um, but, and then sometimes I think it's usually just like 
not paying attention to fatigue for a long amount of time and letting that fatigue really uh, an inflammation even just build and build and build and then you just can't do it anymore um you know if it's an acute injury and it goes away in a few days or a few weeks then maybe this isn't a big problem but for chronic type injuries i think it becomes a lot more apparent for people to be very critical of their technique because of the fear of if they go back to you know the old technique that they're they're going to get hurt and so i think the the point about technique there is like they really need to be understanding that as long as they're pain free then the the technique is good right like like they look at it and they're afraid if you're afraid of a movement that might hurt you you know coming back from an injury and it's not you know the movement doesn't look good but you're you're pain free or it looks okay mediocre but you're pain free like that's the priority right similar to like when you want to get strong is it does it feel okay for you to continue to get strong and if that's what you're focusing on that's actually what you care about instead of actually you're self-limiting because you know you're just so afraid of another re-injury you know that can become a problem where technique and perfection really just is what you're fixating on does that make sense yeah right. the other uh, the other thing i was going to add to that too is i mean what really is the source of said pain you know is it really the movement is it really lifting or maybe there's some kind of emotional stress in your life that's so bad that it's actually referring as a pain symptom because that that is a real thing so yeah you have to take that pain level seriously if it's if it's hurting you during a movement but at the same time that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to stop either if you're able to stay in good sound position uh and it's not necessarily increasing your pain then what's the problem of getting some work in maybe that movement will help you maybe that will de-stress you yeah and the other part i, I don't want to get too much on the pain because it's gonna that's a, we actually have a podcast <laughs> on that <laughs> you guys are a big rabbit hole yeah yeah but yeah. I, I do want to get back to um technical proficiency and like almost obsession because it's something that i i like think about myself is that i'm all a little bit too critical you know the bar speed usually isn't that that great um but actually just kind of creating the habit like so if you know this about yourself that you are kind of a technique freak you know and you just want everything perfect kind of just creating the habit of just like knowing that that isn't the most important thing and, and believing it even even though like they're naturally going to say well this isn't how i wanted it to look so i'm just going to stop it here creating the habit like of, of just ignoring it almost like like because you, you develop these like connections between certain things and, and the habits that you have with, with everything. So breaking those habits and allowing your mind to let go of this idea of technical perfection is probably going to be the easiest way to, well, it's not easy, but it's the most practical way to really allow you to put more weight on the bar and, and being mindful of, okay, 80% is fine. You know, I want to add more weight. I want to get stronger and just practicing that as a, as a, I don't want to say technique, but as a uh, a method, I guess, for getting stronger is probably the the best way to go about it. One one way to go about it. Yeah, and I think it's important to to kind of reiterate that we're not saying that technical mastery is bad. It's just that you need to balance technical mastery with getting strong. You know, that an over focus on either end of the spectrum leads to bad outcomes. If you overfocus on technical perfection, then you forget to add more weight to the bar and, and actually get as strong as you can. If you overfocus on just getting strong at all costs, then your technique goes out the window and you never develop that proficiency. At best, you're not able to lift as much as you would like to lift because good technique is good technique for a reason. Uh, and at worst, you know, you come up, you come up injured. Um, the other thing on the topic of injury that I wanted to just chime in with, I don't have any data on this, and maybe this would be an interesting thing for us to, to look at more closely, but I wonder how much of the injuries that we see uh, just as, as a group of coaches uh, could be traced back to poor technique versus um, versus just overwork, you know, an, an imbalance between 
volume and recovery. And we know that that's a tight line that you have to walk, especially the more advanced you get, uh, that you have to apply big training stresses, uh, but also you, you have to uh, recover from those stresses. So it's not an easy thing to navigate. And, and now that I'm talking about it out loud, I, I think it's probably combinations, you know, uh, my gut feeling is that there's a lot of the uh, overwork, but, you know, technique could have been a hair better. Uh, and that probably would have helped too, you know? Um, but yeah, that that's avoiding injury is another balance point. I, I would say those are probably your two primary causes though. Um, you know, an imbalance between work and recovery, uh, and improper technique. I would say those are probably the two main, main things. <clears throat> well, uh, I don't think I got to chime in with my two cents on the uh, the topic of how to how to not focus on technique if that's your problem. Um, one thing that that I like to do is to to judge your RPE on technical failure uh, versus or, or not to judge RPE on technique. To judge your RPE on absolute failure if your problem is that you're kind of one of these people that are over focusing on technique. So in that case, make sure that you're judging on absolute failure. You know, could you have ground out one more rep? Yeah, could you have done two? Well, yeah, but that second one would have been pretty ugly. Well, then then yes, two. You know, so if you judge your RPE based on that, uh, then that's going to naturally drive you toward heavier weights. And, and I think that kind of goes back to, to what you were saying earlier, Mark. Um, I think the thing to, that I want to add to that though, is to just to say that, so this online system that we've been developing over the last couple of years now, uh, for logging training and planning training and stuff like that. Um, if you do that, then that system will help take care of you. You know, say today you're supposed to do a triple at a nine RPE, uh, but you're over focused on technique. So you didn't go heavy enough. You didn't actually get to a nine RPE. If you rate that accurately in terms of your absolute failure and you called it an eight RPE instead, then it's going to drive a change to your estimated one RM. And that's going to drive a change to your projected weights for the next week. And it's going to gradually increase those weights. Uh, it's going to drive those weights heavier and heavier. Um, and you'll find out where that limit is as long as you're trying to be as honest as you can with your RPE rating and you're consistent in the system. So any other uh, thoughts that you guys want to circle back to as far as technique, uh, the focus of it, anything like that? Yeah, there was one that I wanted to point out too for people with, with uh, maybe more on the on the lower end of proficiency level. Um, and like when you got somebody that's not very proficient in the movement, it's uh, uh, recognizing recognizing that usually is fairly easy, but the process of building them back up is not always that easy, especially if you give them this bombardment of cues and you give them 25 different things to work on, they're going to be really overwhelmed and have a hard time dealing with that whereas if you break it down to the more important ones one or two cues one or two positional changes work on those build those up and then bring in one or two you know like each week or every other week depending on where things are at start building that up and then i've noticed a lot of times as you build those things up then there comes this point where the lifter is like, ah, just, I'm still not getting it. Like, I don't feel like I'm moving well and blah, blah, blah. And you see that over the course of these several weeks to a couple months, whatever it is, that they've made some pretty drastic improvements. But because there's always stuff to work on, they feel like they haven't. So then you point out to them like, hey, you should go back and watch the video that you sent me when we first started. And then now watch what you just sent me today. And you'll see that there's this drastic difference that just occurred. And a lot of times that gives them a big boost of confidence and reinvigorates their spirits and gets them more mentally back into their training and prepared to go tackle the next session. And I really like that. I think that's huge in 
you know, helping, helping the mind and keeping them in a positive mindset. So they don't constantly always get beat down with all these things that they're not doing correctly. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's an excellent technique. Yep. I, I agree with that and just would add that, uh, add to what you just said, Ross, about prioritizing. Like, you know, I, I get an ath, new athlete or whatever and see a bunch of stuff and I don't, same thing. You know, I don't want to blast them with like 10 different things. Do this, do this, do this. Like, let's start simple here so you're not completely buried and uh, just start with this. This is the biggest one first big thing. And then we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Kind of the last thing that I wanted to touch on before we wrap up is probably the most difficult scenario that I see uh, for for application of this 80% perfect technique rule. Um, let's say that you've got a lifter who you're working with and you're looking at their videos and they're pulling with a round back style. Uh, and you talk to them about it and they go, oh, I wasn't aware that what I was doing was dangerous, you know. Uh, so let's fix it, you know. All right, so you want to transition them from a round back deadlift to a flat back deadlift. To me, this is one of the most difficult challenges that I see in terms of getting them to technical proficiency. Because let's be honest, it's not that hard to get them to deadlift with a flat back. Usually it's a matter of taking enough weight off the bar. The problem is to get them to deadlift a PR with a flat back. And that's a much different problem, much more difficult to solve. Um, so have you guys come across any tips, tricks for helping someone switch from a round back style to a flat back style on the deadlift? I think oftentimes Go ahead, that, almost seems, that almost seems to come down to getting them to mentally accept <clears throat> that load drop to build back up to a previous weight. Um, I mean, you work so hard to put more weight on the bar and now all of a sudden you got to take a whole bunch of weight off the bar to correct this deficiency. Um, yeah, it's kind of, that, that sucks. It's a hard thing to do. Uh, not most of us don't want to have to do that. So getting, getting a person into that mental headspace where they can be okay with taking 50, 60, whatever pounds off the bar and knowing that it's going to take a couple of months to to get back to where they were yeah, can be can be hard, especially if they come to you and be like, "Oh, I want to, I want help getting ready for this meet in a month." Right? <laughs> uh, are you okay with deadlifting a lot less? You know, so that can be getting. Yeah. I think getting a person in the right headspace is oftentimes very beneficial. So I have a solution potentially for some people. Obviously, a lot of these, this is really, really difficult because I think with every single person, there's a different mindset they have, they have with their own deadlift and with how they feel about it. Um, so this is something that works with people who, um, you know, they're not as attached, I think, to the ego associated with their, their strength. Um, so maybe other people, but in, incorporating very strict Romanian deadlifts or hip hinging, like really prioritizing the hip hinge and teaching that movement pattern to, to keep the, you know, the hips high and, and the hamstrings and the hips tight. Um, I think a lot of times when people have a really uh, rounded back on a deadlift, it's because they're not sure of like how to actually get their hips to the bar um, in an, an efficient way because they haven't really learned that hip hinging movement pattern. And this is obviously like I can't say everybody, but it's something that at least is a movement that they can work on while maybe they're working on, you know, lowering the weight and, and having the actual competition deadlift with a straighter back. It's strict Romanian deadlifts um, with a high emphasis on improving their breathing pattern and the bracing. Uh, and I think the breathing and bracing thing is also pretty huge for me too, is a lot of people aren't even breathing. Uh, they're not even getting tight in their core. So they're getting tight in their upper back, they're getting tight in their hips, but they're, they're really loose in, in that torso area. Uh, so those are usually the two things that I, I look at. Um, and I, I mean, a lot of, I think I've had a, a good amount of success, but I haven't had.
a total transformation yet, I think, where someone's just, <clears throat> you know, but. It's, it's tough because I don't see it as ever being truly complete, you know, yeah. like, I don't think, I don't think it's like, you know, you're done, <laughs> you know, you can <laughs> successfully transition to a flat back deadlift and you never have to worry about it again. Um, it's always, it's going to be a fight for a long time and, and under the best of circumstances, I think it's a fight for a long time. Um, I do see, I think the round back tendency come from primarily two places, uh, among people who are trying, uh, to deadlift with a flat back. Um, you get some people who their erectors aren't strong enough to maintain the position. So they, they round them over. And then you get other people who, whose glutes aren't strong enough to move the weight in that position. So rounding your back helps you to move your glutes into a more advantageous position. So it's not clear just from watching somebody deadlift, which scenario you're looking at, you know, it, it, it takes some work to kind of dig that out. Now, fortunately, most things that you're going to do to strengthen the glutes are going to involve the erectors and vice versa. So, uh, the prescription isn't hugely dependent on that identification, but that's one thing that came to mind when you were talking about the RDLs, uh, Jim. I think that's a that's a, a good tool to use, and, and I still I like to keep that three prong approach. You know, when it comes to the competition exercise, we need to judge it on technical failure, and you just need to treat the flat back deadlift like it's a new movement. Like this is an exercise I've never done before. You know, I've got new PRs and, you know, in this lift and you don't compare it to the old lift. And I think that helps the psychological transition. And then the uh, pause deadlifts and tempo deadlifts, you know, same type of stuff that you would do to fix any sort of technical cue. But then strengthening the glutes and the erectors, I think that can help as well. One issue that you see with round back deadlifting in particular, though, is that it's we, when we talk about it, we talk about it like it's a binary, right? That you're either flat or you're rounded and there's no in between. But when you start watching videos, you see people who are trying really hard to deadlift with a flat back position and they round just a little bit and you go, well, is that much okay? You know, and it's easy to sit here and say, well, no, no rounding is okay. Well, that's not a great answer either, because now we're back at this technical perfection ideal that just isn't very effective. So the line that I've started drawing in the sand recently is, do we see excess spinal extension on the lockout? You know, if their spine is maintaining pretty much the same position through the range of motion, then I think we're good. If I'm starting to see, you know, they get to that locked out position and then there's a little bit of extra spinal extension to, to fully lock out the weight, then we're probably too rounded. Mark, did you have something that you wanted to add? I think you've been waiting for kind of a while. Well, we, we kind of went beyond that. I was just going to uh, say that with the initial question, it kind of, for me, it comes back somewhat to personality. I mean, whether somebody falls to, on one of those extremes, either two technique or I just want to lift heavy shit. You know, the, the guy that's pulling round back and would like to pull flat back, but he just wants to really lift heavy shit, isn't going to do what it takes to lift heavy shit flat back. He just wants to pull heavy deadlifts. And so I think you got to warn him about the uh, hazards and just go with it, you know. Uh, as best you can and the guy who is willing to back off and and do all these things you guys just were talking about uh to do it flat back great but as far as coaching that i think that's what i see it's tough you know because it's we don't really want the things that we say we want and the things that we want change you know like we're fickle people um, so, I mean, I think it's easy to, you know, after you've just had a, an injury or a bad deadlift session and you're sitting here and your coach says, Hey, here's the risks of what you're doing currently. I kind of think we ought to do it a different way. 
you know, it's easy to, to then say, yeah, you know what? I think, I, I think you're right. I think I ought to transition to a flat back position. But then, you know, you're in the gym and you can put a PR on the bar and you know that, yeah, I'm probably going to get a little too rounded on this. You know, like it's, you want a different thing in that moment, you know? Right. And shiny and things. Yeah. That's what I was just getting, just getting ready to say is one of my guys, uh, just, uh, went in deadlift me. He, and he pulls round back. He, he would like to pull flat back, but he just wants to lift heavy stuff. <laughs> so, you know, he hasn't had any problems, no injuries whatsoever, no, uh, ill, you know, secondary side effects from round back pulling, whatever. He just did a deadlift meet, pulled three and a half times body weight at at 83 kilos. Uh, round back, no problem. He's been doing this for years. Yeah. Well, you know, what can I say? Well, so the way, the way this is a good point, actually, and I'm, I'm glad we're touching on this, too, because I don't think that everybody should try to make this transition because it's 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 i i sincerely believe that some people can never pull it off you know i think for some people like look you're going to move from a round back position where you're fairly proficient to a flat back position that you're not really built for uh and it's going to take a long time and you may never get as strong you may never get back to that pr you know we we hope that's not the case but that might be the case you know now you also have to understand that deadlifting with a round back style isn't a guarantee of an injury. I think it's safe to say that it assumes more risk than a flat back style, but like I deadlifted with a flat back and I still got injured. So deadlifting with a flat back isn't a guarantee that you're going to stay injury free either. I think on the whole, it's probably less risk, but you're still playing a game of odds, you know? And you know, things like we're talking about the architecture of your hips, things like the architecture of your spinal discs matter, you know, when you're talking about applying these kinds of forces to them over the course of decades in some cases, you know, and so, the natural shape of the spine, where are yeah. they, where is their, where is their flexion occurring? Right. So there's, there's, and you can't see that stuff just by watching somebody lift weights. So there's things that, we don't know and for all practical purposes can't know you know so we're we're playing the odds a little bit on this so that's why i think it's important to to communicate that with the lifter like hey did you know that you're doing this yeah you did hey are you aware of the risks of round back deadlifting yeah i am and i'm i'm fine with it well okay then i will do my best to help you with the thing that you're trying to do because it's not a guarantee that you're going to get hurt you know, it, it assumes more risk, but if that person is competent and capable of assuming that risk, then, Hey, they're a grown up. you know, they can do, they can do that if they want. So anyway, wow, <laughs> quite a, quite a range of topics today, but, um, I do think that we are out of time guys, but before we go, I just wanted to mention real quick that, uh, over the last couple weeks now, uh, we've released a number of updates to uh, the RTS website. Um, in particular, the, the training log function. We've changed a lot of how uh, the data is input, the kind of the user interface for inputting data. So now we have a distinct area for people to do training planning. So uh, the workout planner will populate those, uh, those fields for you. Um, you can go in there and plan out your workouts, plan target weights and everything like that. And then when you actually go to the gym, logging your workouts a lot easier. It's more or less hitting a button. And then just the only typing that you really even have to do is for deviations from the plan. And then to go beyond that, we're starting to get to the point, and I would say starting more or less this week, uh, where we can, we as RTS coaches can write training for our lifters in the system. So our lifters are logging their workouts in our, in our system. And now the system knows what they're supposed to do next time. So we can get as far as uh, planning out uh, target weights for them, uh, all done automatically. Um, 
you know, filling out their training log is easier for them to do, which means that the coaches get better data and we're better able to do this radical individualization process that we've been talking about so much. Um, so yeah, we're constantly improving this, this, uh, whole system. And this system is available for free for anybody to use. You just go to reactive training systems.com. You log in you click on apps and you're there. Uh, you don't have to use a certain training style or be coached by a certain person or anything like that. It's there for anybody to use that wants to. Uh, so if you're interested in something like that, please take advantage. And uh, thanks, guys, for sitting around talking about technique with me. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. We'll talk to you guys next time. Reactive Training Systems.